raise my voice for you. Um, I'm Liz Wiley. I'm the executive director of the Marion Institute. I'd like to thank you all for coming. We really appreciate this turnout. It's wonderful. Um, you know, when people come out for events, I'm always so gracious for your time because time is, seems like the the uh, slippery slippery thing to get, right? It's just there's never enough of it, and so we really appreciate you taking the time to spend an evening with us tonight. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd also like to thank Ryan Wagner, who's out there in the back. He's a little Ryan. Ryan is the owner of Weatherwell Farms, and he's also a board member of the Marion Institute. And without Ryan uh, and his in-kind donation and his team, this event wouldn't have been possible tonight. So thank you so much, Ryan. Really <laughs> what they wanted to eat. So she would offer them 
you know, 30 something, 30 plus items, and they could just eat what they wanted, and it would change from day to day, and some things some kids never touched, other kids did touch it. But, you know, it was monitored, and it was studied, and the pediatrician that worked with it said, I've never seen healthier kids. Um, and I remember thinking, like, wow, that, like, totally, my little self-study at home was proven to be, to be correct uh, as I was reading this. So that's sort of my personal uh, story of why nourishment is such, you know, sort of interesting to me. But then, from the Marion Institute lens, and from a bioregulatory lens, um, how many of you are familiar with the Marion Institute? How many of you have heard us talk about bioregulatory medicine? Okay, how many have heard you talk, uh, us talk about biological medicine? A little more familiar with it. So, this is, this is what happens often, is we get very excited because we're really passionate about bioregulatory medicine, and we talk about it, and then we get this sort of like, hmm, what you talking about now? Uh, look, and so, we want to look for ways that we can break it down for, for different audiences to say it's really not that complicated, it's a different term, it's different from our Western allopathic medicine, it's practiced in Europe, but it's actually really easy for you to implement and think about in your own lives. And so, one of the things that, um, when we talk about bioregulatory medicine, when we're explaining it to people, we often say there's these three pillars of bioregulatory medicine nutrition, immune building, and detoxification. And then, as I learned more about, about Fred and read the book and, 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 and did more research on what his book was about, you know, he was talking about the same thing. He was talking about three pillars of nutritional wisdom. And, and his way of looking at it was saying, you know, we have these flavor feedback loops, we have variety of wholesome foods, and we have the social cultural um, component of it. And so I started to look at this and say, wow, there is a lot of overlap in what he's saying and what we're saying. And this is really helpful for us to start to look at ways that these things overlap so that we can explain bioregulatory medicine in ways that no matter who we're talking to can understand it, whether it's a child that we're working with through our grow education program and doing garden and planting gardens and then trying to embed nutritious, nutrient-rich foods into their, their cafeteria foods, or if it's, you know, talking about it more from a health component. You know, there's so many things that as you, as, as I'm assuming most of you know because you're here tonight, have this inclination like our food is really important and our food is really key to helping us to be healthy and, and uh, be healthy, our optimal health. And so another aspect of what Fred talked about, talks about in his book is the uniqueness of, of food choices and how for 30 plus years he has studied this with animals. He's studied it with wild animals, he's studied it with livestock, he's studied it with sheep, goat, a lot. <laughs> and sort of saying like, you know, it's the same thing that they'll, they'll forage on different things to, depending on what their unique body needs at that unique time. And wondering how that plays into, into our food system these days when there's so much that's being preached at us. You know, and I think at some point you use the term, like, our food system's been sort of hijacked. And, and I, I love that. I love that concept of, like, it is a little hijacked. And how do we get back to, you know, understanding what's, what's important, not just, it, it, not just what's important for everybody, but uniquely for yourself. How do you develop that wisdom for yourself? Um, which he will do a much better job of talking about. Um, so those are definitely the parallels that I saw in why it would be helpful to bring Fred here to sort of show what his, how his work interrelates with bioregulatory medicine or lifestyle medicine or ecological medicine, right? So Fred, I am going to do a little bit of the Bible though. Fred's very helpful on today, and uh, he's like, I don't like it when people read that whole list, so I abbreviated it. You Liz has done know. such a good job already of overviewing, I'll just probably answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. So I'm going to read this place so that I don't miss anything. Um, Fred, Fred is a professor at, uh, Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University, 
where for 30 plus years he directed an award-winning research group that pioneered understanding how learning influences interrelationships among soils, plants, herbivores, and humans. Fred also is one of the founders of BEHAVE, that stands for Behavioral Education for Human, Animal, Vegetation, and Ecosystem Management, an international network of scientists and land managers committed to integrating behavioral principles with local knowledge to enhance environmental, economic, and cultural values of rural and urban communities. He's also the author of Foraging Behavior and co-author of The Art and Science of Shepherding. He's co-authored or authored an outstanding number of peer-reviewed um, papers. So I'm going to say approximately 250. Does that put, you, put it in the right ball, ballpark? Um, his book, Nourishment, uses his research to look at how animals choose their foods. He writes that when given a choice, of natural foods, livestock, and astounding refined palate, nibbling through the day on as many as 50 kinds of grasses, forbs, and shrubs to meet their nutritional needs with remarkable precision, choosing biochemically rich foods that meet the body's nutritional and medicinal needs. He then looks at how humans match up to that. And you guys can kind of guess how that goes. <laughs> but without further ado, I will bring Fred up here to, to take over. spend an evening here uh, with, with me and with, with all the group. Um, I'll give a little bit of background here on, uh, on how I actually got started into, into all, of, all of this business. I was telling Liz earlier that um, I was always interested in, in outdoors, in wild kind of places, and wild, wild creatures. And that led me to go to Colorado State University and major in wildlife biology. That's, I really loved that, and learning about plants, animals, ecology was a young discipline actually, 50, 55 years ago when we were there. So learning about all that was, was amazing to me. But at that same time, I was working on a ranch. I never. I didn't come from a ranch, my family wasn't that. But um, I was working on a, in a greenhouse during those days, and I had a friend who said, you want to earn some extra money um, in the evenings and on the weekends? And I said, sure. He said, we can go to Henry DeLuca's place, who I talk about in the book, and we can haul hay for eight cents a bag, four cents a piece. You know, that's doing the math here. The other day, a thousand bales like forty dollars. <laughs> so ten thousand is only four hundred. So we were making a lot of money, but back this is, sounds really old person. Not back in the day, that was a lot of money. But anyway, so I went out there and got to know Henry, and I, I absolutely loved it. I loved it. So the next summer. I ended up, I started working on the ranch, rather than working in the greenhouse when I was in college, so working on the ranch. Um, and I did that all the way through college. When I finished college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew it wouldn't be mainline kind of wildlife biology work. I didn't know what, and so I thought, well, I'll just go back to the ranch. Henry needs somebody to run the ranch, so I'll go back there. And now somehow it will just come to me. And, and so I went and ran the ranch for another couple of years. And during that time, it just developed up that I would really like to be interested to try to do research. And I don't have a clue why that happened. Uh, I didn't have any idea of what research was. But anyway, so that's what happened. And I ended up then, I didn't have the best grades in the world, to be honest with you. There were a lot of other interests I had when I went to college. <laughs> like I used to say, there were three seasons, hunting, fishing, and skiing. And I only survived the end of one because the other one was coming around. So, but anyway, um, so I checked around and, and finally ended up getting into Utah State University. And, and it was really just a fabulous place to be. And uh, my dream research in those days would have been to study mountain goats foraging in the Rocky Mountains. 
it didn't turn out that way, what I ended up working on was domestic goats foraging down in the extreme southwestern corner of Utah in a in landscape that's dominated by a shrub called blackbird. It's quite, quite different, obviously, from the landscapes out here. It's very arid. Um, black brush grows pretty much in monoculture. I mean, that's a picture of it and some of the goats that we worked with back in the day. And I thought nothing could be more boring than this study. But it's funded and it's going to give me an assistantship, which I did at that when my wife and I went out there. And so, but it turned out to be amazing because it was a little bit like a laboratory to study. And so a couple of things happened when we were there. The idea was to use goats as mobile pruning machines to prune the shrub during the winter time, which would stimulate new growth. This plant is, is a plant that's regrown after it's been browsed in the, in the winter time. All this new growth. And we knew that that new growth was higher in energy, higher in protein, higher in minerals than the old woody stuff on these plants here. And so that was the idea, and it was to improve those landscapes for cattle, which wintered down there. You may not think that cattle should live on shrubs. It's amazing what locally adapted animals can do. They, they put their heads down and browse better than a goat across those landscapes. And it's a learned kind of behavior. I'll get into that as we go. But, and also for the wildlife species that were down there. That was the idea. But what happened was, after we did that that first year, put goats down the next year, there's all these plants with new growth. The goats don't want to eat the new growth. They, do, they refuse, they absolutely avoid it like the plague. Most of them, that individuality, you know, 20% of the goats haven't heard what I'm saying, the other 80% are going to do it. So that was one thing that was like, okay, well, what's, what's the deal here? Based on nutrient content, they ought to be eating this stuff. It's far better than the old woody. They're not. The other thing, we had six pastures down there, so six groups of goats on separate pastures. Why we did that doesn't matter. We had these six different groups though. And in one of the pastures, the goats start to eat these, these little things. These are wood rat houses. That's a wood rat house. And they build them at the base of these juniper trees. And the houses have, have a whole bunch of chambers inside. And then they cover the, the shingles on the outside are bark. They cover the, the outside of the house of bark. Well, the goats in this one pasture start eating wood rat houses. Now, black brush is terrible, but wood rat houses look even worse, right? So two things are happening down there that, you know, I start to think, well, what the heck is going on? And you start to develop ideas, huh? Well, I think, I think they're avoiding these because, and I think they're eating this because. And then that's, that's what really stimulated them for me to think, you know, we really need to understand what's going on here better. Now, when, when I went back to, to Utah State University and was talking with animal nutritionists and toxicologists that I, that I know, and this isn't meant to be, anything I say isn't meant to be criticism, it, it's reflecting, and it's reflecting on what we thought at the time. Just like in 20 years, people could think about what I'm saying tonight, and they could say, he was really full of shit, or whatever, you know, I thought he knew something. <laughs> and he was looking pretty serious, <laughs> wasting a whole evening here. <laughs> no, but I mean, we learn, we just keep learning and learning, right? So this isn't, like, but when I went back to Utah State University, I was talking to a toxicologist, and I said, man, these goats are not doing <laughs> And he said, well, I guess that just goes to show you that livestock lack nutritional wisdom. And at that time, and I think still a lot today, and absolutely for human beings, I think it's what I'm going to say next is the case, there's a general feeling among people who, who study these things that animals lack nutritional wisdom. Domestic animals and human beings. The idea with domestic is that as a result of 10,000 years of domestication, it's been lost. I'm going to a conference in Innsbruck to speak in another month or so. 
and they want me to speak about one of the topics they want me to speak is after 10,000 years of domestication, do live, are livestock still able to self-medicate? It's a conference on that stuff. So, but there's this sense that that's been lost as a result of domestication. Now with wild animals, nobody knows for sure, but they figured, you know, in order for them to survive, they certainly must know something out there, right? So that's, that's where we started off then, 45 years or so ago, was trying to think about the, these kind of issues. And then nourishment is just a, a reflections on that written while uh, Sue and I were living in the backwoods of Colorado. There are five different parts to, to nourishment, five different sections. And I mention that because I'm going to try to touch, give you a little bit of flavor of, of what's in each of those sections as I go along. The first one is dining with change. And throughout my career, that's really been a guiding kind of theme and something I've thought about over constantly is this notion that things are forever changing forever, forever changing and, uh, and reflecting on that. What's, that. what's that really mean? It's mostly that the only constant in life is change. So that's the first part. And then dancing with the wisdom of the body gets into what Liz reviewed already, so I can really go through that section quickly. <laughs> yeah, the, three, the three legs to the stool. And, and, uh, and saving the artist's palette has to do with that as well. And then I'll move into these two sections that, for me, being in the backwoods of Colorado and reflecting over, over a lifetime and over a career were really where my, my psyche was and still is, this notion of the, the fundamental uncertainty of a visit to this planet and then the, the mystery, the mystery and the wonder. Do you remember? what it was like when you were a little kid, a tiny little kid, and everything you saw on this planet was amazing to you. Did you, did you have that, Deborah? For me, it was. You know, it was like everything, and I wanted to own, have it all, whether it was catching frogs or catching fish or catching, you know, I was just fascinated by, by all that stuff. Well, when we moved back there, and I got away from the university, left, and, uh, Nobody knew us from anybody, you know, we were just all alone up there. It was really like that again. There, there were all kinds, the plants were amazing. The landscape, we were living at 9,500 feet elevation, surrounded by these 14,000 foot peaks in all directions. This beautiful parkland, we're at the transition between the aspens and conifers and this south park. And it was just, it was, it was a meditation. Sue and I were living, living in a meditation. We'd say to each other, oh, you know, we're in a dimension of heaven right here. That, it's not somewhere else. It's, you know, it's wherever you are. We're, we're here. And so that was, yeah, I'm getting along with you. But that, that's really what, what was interesting to me to write the book at that point was to grapple with uncertainty, fading into, into mystery and so forth. So I'll try to touch on those and give you a little flavor of what's in there. Starting with this time and the change. And, uh, you know, I took a lot of, of classes at the graduate level when I was a graduate student. And classes, they all were in one way or another about change. Whether it was plant communities, I did a lot of work on plants and plant communities. And, if you look over any time frame at all, they're constantly, constantly changing. Uh, same with animal. If you look from, from the, the Little Ice Age till now, plants and animals are moving, moving, moving around these continents, right? And, and you get really steeped in that as you're taking these classes. And, you, uh, and so you start to think, well, just extrapolate that. And it, it's all moving. And then you think about extinction rates, and you learn that 99.9% .9 of every, all the species that have been on this planet are extinct, you know, and you start to think about impermanence, and, uh, and so that, that, that way, but when you get into evolutionary biology and so forth, um, Darwin and his theories about evolution are really an important part, an amazing part of that that you learn about, and then, um, but I was left a little bit, and this may have not been intentional by the professors, with a kind of a rigid, a bit of a rigid view of evolution. Um, creatures propose, environments dispose kind of view, you know, that, so the creatures aren't really participating in this, they're just, you have a lot of variation and the environment selects them. I, 
I don't feel that way much after 50 years of studying these and studying animals and, and looking at them. I think it's so much about relationships that every individual, as Liz says, is unique. Everyone is different. And what they do is create relationships with their environment. I'm thinking now of this little chipmunk that used to live where we lived there in the backwoods. That chipmunk's different from all the other chipmunks that are up there. You come to see, you watch that chipmunk each day, you see where it makes its little home, where it stores its medicinal plants and quote our wood pile and so forth. Huh? You come to see, I come to think of it anyway, as not so much just this robot that's there, this gene-driven robot, but something that really is creating relationships with the environment that, that it lives in. And we're knowing and learning more and more about epigenetics and the importance of epigenetics on influencing form, function, and behavior, and the dynamics and all that. So that's, that's one of the points that I want to make, create relationships. They're involved in the world, which helps them then to evolve with the world. That's, that's more how, how I view it at this point. Now this little thing doesn't work here. I tried to bring it up and it, it won't work. That's not the end of the world. But it's a, it's a really fantastic video that attracts a, a oyster catcher. That's a piece of bread there. And if this video were working, uh, I'll try it. I, I What you would see is he starts to catch it, puts the bread out, grabs it, puts it out, grabs it, puts it out, grabs it, puts it out, grabs it. And you know you're sitting there, if you haven't seen it, or maybe your imagination isn't going, you're wondering, where's, where's this going? Puts it out, grabs it, puts it out. Pretty soon, wow, got a fish, right? The fish comes to eat the piece of bread, wants to catch your nails in the fish. It's so cool. That, that's the first time it hasn't worked. I don't know why. Can you picture how that's going to be? And then I'll just watch and I'm like, well, okay, that's interesting. What's, and then bam, it's got a fish. Well, how did the oyster catcher figure that out? How does, that's, what I, that's what struck me over the years in the work we did, is watching individual animals. Now, I mentioned those goats, right, that they eat wood rat in the one pasture, they ate wood rat houses. The other five, and that was in over three years with 18 groups of goats. That's the only group of goats that ever ate those wood rat houses. So why eat wood rat houses? Well, if you scrape that bark away, you find different rooms in that house. And one is the bathroom. And the bathroom is soaked in urine. What that means is that that vegetation there is a non-protein nitrogen supplement. And that supplement help them to better digest the black brush, the woody black brush. I, I won't go into the details of how that works, but does that make some sense of what's happening? They figured that out, and after three months down there, the group that did that was in much better body weight than the other five groups. It was really significant for them, but only one group over three years out of 18 groups ever figured that out. The Einstein of the goat world, I guess, was in that group or whatever, but, but that's the cut without attempting to go into more examples, I'm not going to be here all night, but you see, that's what struck me is watching animals and spending a lot of time and thinking about how individuals figure things out. And then, as a group, that spread through all that group. Every goat in that pasture was eating wood rat houses. If we'd have wanted all of the wood rats to eat, we'd have just needed to put goats that ate with those other groups, right? But we didn't, and so that's, uh, it's that, that kind of thing, and it's those relationships, and then that topic that Liz alluded to that I'll go on to talk about, that whole social, cultural, transgenerational part of things becomes really, really a critical part. It's not just about genes, it's about these relationships. So, Nature builds factors with individuals and note to our life. Nature, of course, sameness. And this book, The Triple Helix, that Richard Lewontin wrote, I think it's a fabulous short little book. And what he's talking about is that it's not just genes, it's not just environments. You know, you would get this, but it's genes plus environments plus chance. And I'm not going to 
talk much about chance today. I do in the book. I think chance becomes a really important part of creativity in the system. Now, you could argue a lot of people do that. Nobody ever makes a choice. Us, any creature. It's all just driven by genes and the environment. But you start to throw chance into the mix and you look at chance during development at, the, at, at uh, fundamental levels as creatures are developing and you start to see a real dynamic in there. So genes plus environment plus chance assures that no two individuals are ever alive. This book here, written by Roger Williams over 50 years ago, is really an amazing book. Biochemical Individuality is what it's called. It's, it's not the most interesting book necessarily to read unless you get into that, but he does such a phenomenal job of just talking about how every one of us is so uniquely different, inside, outside. You know, we all know that we can be identified by our fingerprints, blood town can track us by our odors, but when you start to look inside of us, how we're built, how we function, he just lays out such a marvelous case. And this is 50 years ago, he says, what this means, what this means from a nutrition standpoint is that because we each are built differently, we each need differently, we're the only one that can figure out what we actually need to meet our needs. That was one point. And he also was looking ahead to say that in medicine that means that it's going to have to be absolutely unique to each person. It's going to have to be individualized because averages are meaningless, right? There is no such thing as an average anything. Huge, huge point, I think. And if you think about all the recommendations that are made in nutrition, or anything else, they're what? They're for the average, but it's so, I think, so critical to realize that none of us, we're just, we're each really, really different. And, uh, okay, so dining with the, with the wisdom of the body then. If you think about it, nobody has to tell a bacteria, a wild bird, or a fish what to eat, how to reproduce, what, to, what they know how to do those things and they're very successful at doing them or they wouldn't be here. Uh, even the lowly laboratory rat, if it's given choices, and Richter did, a guy named Richter did this work back in the 40s, phenomenal kind of work showing that rats will forage as a function of meat and they're really good at meeting their needs. He, so they can rectify needs for all kinds of different from minerals to essential amino acids and so forth. But also I think it's interesting nowadays that rats that are rendered diabetic, voluntary, voluntarily select diets devoid of carbohydrates consuming primarily protein and fat. So they do what they need to do to, to get out of the type 2 diabetes that they've been put into. Huh? Now think about the irony. People have to be told by authority figures what and what not to eat. How we're constantly, constantly being bombarded. And again, this isn't trying to be the big critic or anything, just reflecting. I mean, we're, we're bombarded with, with, um, with what and what not to eat. So the question then that I thought about as I started to write nourishment is, do our bodies lack the ability to uh, identify and select nourishing diets, much the way people believe, think and thought about livestock, or has that ability been hijacked? And so tonight what I'll lay out and argue is that the ability's been hijacked and just talk about the way that that's, that's taken place. So three legs to the stool here of, of what I would consider uh, nutritional <coughs> And what are these flavor feedback relationships? The second is the availability of alternative foods. And the third are the social cultural languages. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about each of, each of those categories and what they mean. But the, the key idea that I would say is that if we break any one of those linkages, you're not going to get nutritional wisdom. It's just not possible. And in many cases, with domestic animals and with human beings, we've broken all three of the linkages, basically. Yeah, the, so, flavor feedback relationships, these biochemically mediated uh, relationships. Uh, if I were to ask you why you like a particular food, what would you tell me? It tastes good. Tastes good, right? Yeah, that's right. Don't overthink it at all. If I ask you why you don't like a particular food, 
What would you say? Thanks, Matt. Yeah. And here, that's that's absolutely the case. But what I want to get you to thinking about is that palatability, that liking, is more than a matter of taste. It's more than a matter of taste. Certainly, taste is fundamental, and it's the sense, taste and smell, are the senses that we're going to use. But there, there are these feedbacks that are emanating from cells and organ systems, including the microbiome, that are changing our liking for the flavor of foods. And it's not a conscious thing. We did experiments in Australia several years ago where we put sheep in deep, deep anesthesia. During the time the feedback was occurring, they still acquire a preference or an aversion to the food. So it's not a conscious kind of thing. Although this conscious part of our brain can override it, and I'll talk about that as I go along. So these flavor feedback relationships then are mediated by what I refer to as primary compounds, and that would be energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, typically what we think of as nutrients. They're also being mediated by these so-called secondary compounds. And um, historically, people haven't thought so much about these compounds. They were just fundamental to our work as we went along. In fact, I started to realize how fundamental when we figured out why the goats, remember I said they won't eat the new growth on the black brush, they won't eat it? That's being mediated by secondary compounds. Originally, these secondary compounds, the term is secondary because biochemists studying plants 50, 60, 70 years ago didn't know what roles these things play. There was a time even where they thought they were waste products of plant metabolism, what the plant, you know, kind of the feces of the plant, basically. That's changed so much over the years. They're, they're not secondary at all. They play fundamentally important roles in ecosystems in every, every facet of ecosystems, including relationships with, with herbivores and, and different kinds of creatures. That's why the goats were avoiding the current season's growth. That's valuable material. We've invested a lot in that. We don't want fungal, microbial, herbivore kind of eating on that tissue, right? So they, they defend it, they defend it. In this case, they, defend, they were defending it with high, high levels of condensed heaven. So these secondary compounds, there's tens of thousands of them. Plant, all plants produce them. Um, we've done some interesting things that shoot us in the foot related to them that I'll talk about as we go along. But that's what's mediating these relationships. Well, back in the day when we were being told that animals don't have nutritional wisdom, and we were trying to think about, well, how would you demonstrate that to a scientist that's very, very critical of this? How would you, how would you be able to show that there is some kind of nutritional wisdom? And we thought about that for a long time to try to figure out how could you do it. I think the best way we came up with was this. We thought, okay, what if we make animals deficient in a particular nutrient? Doesn't matter what it is, I'll show you a bunch of examples. But let's make it not extremely deficient, just mildly deficient in a nutrient. Um, then we do the following. And I'm going to show you a video segment, and this one does work with sheep to show you how it looked when we were doing this. But I'll show you what the way that we did it. On our days, we had one group of sheep, and we would offer, we would offer them straw with apple flavor. Uh, the straw, as you know, isn't a, isn't a very nutritious food, and it wasn't, didn't contain the nutrients we were interested in. So that was a carrier marked by a flavor. Animals in group two on our days got maple flavored straw. Uh, and then after the meal, we took a stomach tube and we simply drenched them with water. Now that only makes sense in relation to what we did on even days. We switched the flavors, but now after the meal, we drench them with the nutrient that they're lacking. And the idea is that there's a relationship between liking for the flavor of the food and feedback from the body from the nutrient. If that's the case, then when we offer animals a choice, between apple and maple flavored food, animals in group one, which should they prefer, apple or maple? 
You're still awake. <laughs> yes, that's right. But apples and group two should prefer apple, right? So that was our workhorse over many years for how we, we did this. Let me show you how it looks. I'm not going to show you any data. I just want to show you how it looks. So in this case here, one group of sheep has been drenched with the, with the nutrients they're lacking, the other group has been drenched with water. And look. Uh, and this is how it looks. <laughs> See, we had high-tech facilities, huh? <laughs> We were a low budget operation. <laughs> So the one group loves it, right? They absolutely love straw. The other group can't figure out what's going on. And it's feedback that's mediating that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Changing their liking for the flavor as a function of um, Back in the days when we were doing some of this work and working with, with energy, I came across this quote from Dave Barry. He says, what are calories? He says, calories are little units that measure how good a particular food tastes. Fudge, for example, has a great many calories, whereas celery, which is not really a food at all, but a member of the plywood family, is <laughs> part of the nature, so we can't wait. Onion dipped into our mouths at parties has none, huh? Add the feedback part, and that's absolutely what's, what's going on with that. Um, so here's where I'll make a really long story, very, very short. We work with with energy and a whole bunch of different forms of energy. We worked with protein. We worked with ratios of energy to protein, always as a function of need. For instance, a young animal is going to want a higher ratio of protein to energy for growth. Huh? An animal that's infected with internal parasites is going to want a higher level of protein relative. We were looking at things like that, looking at ratios, even at rates at which they ferment relative to one another. If you get those out of balance, Animals don't like that. If you have a really highly fermentable energy source, slowly fermentable protein source, or vice versa. Animals, so these what were considered walking compost heaps that had no ability to detect anything, actually we found were incredibly, incredibly sensitive to all these feedbacks. They were in tune with, with their own bodies, is what came to me. We worked with minerals, sodium, phosphorus, calcium, uh, selenium, and some of our colleagues in Australia went on to work with vitamin E. So there's good evidence that, that feedback matters and it's, it, animals will select as a function of need. We went on to do a lot of work with these secondary compounds. And when we first started the work, in the ecological literature, the plant ecology literature, which really <laughs> pioneered all of this work on secondary compounds, there was the general feeling that they their main function related to herbivory was deterrence. They're there to deter. But what we found is everything depends on the dose. It all depends on dose and interaction. At modest amounts, these have really a ton of health benefits, you know? That's the thing that, when they're really high concentrations, like in those blackberry sweets, it's too much for, for most animals, but at modest concentrations. They're really valuable. Well, where I am now with this whole thing is that the more adequate the mix of foods, the more adequate the mix of foods is relative to needs, the greater the liking is. Um, and here's where it goes beyond what science can do because you're talking about interactions amongst literally thousands and thousands of compounds in the body in any meal. For us as well, if you eat a really a meal with wholesome foods and a variety of those, you produce tens of thousands of compounds in the body. So you have to find a point where you kind of buy into this. You say the body 
is absolutely stunningly, amazingly miracle. It knows how to deal with all this, or you just say it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other. But we, because you're dealing with interactions, right? It's not just energy or protein. It's all the primary and secondary compounds interacting one with another. That's that's really where we where we end up. Um, so we did a lot of work with medicine effects as we went along with this stuff. Can animals self-medicate? <laughs> I'm losing you. I'm losing you. Going to sleep on me. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was out of the hotel last night. I realized <laughs> nothing like that happens out west where we live. <laughs> but and again, I'm going to make a really long story short here. What we started out really interested in, in whether or not animals can self-medicate, and so we were using these protocols where we would have something that, that could induce illness. We, we actually started with, with high grain diets, looking at high grain diets. And uh, a feedlot, feedlot kind of thing, you know. And, and finding that those diets actually stimulate the emetic system, the emetic system of the midbrain and brain stem. When that happens in us, we get nauseated. That's how we feel. If you give animals anti emetic drugs, they eat more grain. What's that tell you? It's knocking out the system that's detecting malaise in the animal. Does that make sense? So, so we were then saying, well, if we offer them um, betaline or sodium bicarb, will they voluntarily select that if they're on a high grain diet? And they certainly do. And it alters the pH of the gut. The grain lowers the pH if they have the medicine. It rectifies the pH and they're not sick, right? So that's where we started. Then we, we worked with many, many different tannins for flow, called ethylene glycol, uh, to alleviate from too much tannins, like in the black fresh on the blue growth, like calcium oxal for oxalate. Um, we, did, we did a lot of different studies. I think the, the neatest study we did as we went along though was to have animals learn about three different medicines that could rectify three different uh, illnesses, and then we would put them in a state of, of illness and offer them the three medicines in whatever state they were in, they selected the medicine they needed to rectify the state. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they can do multiple kind of, uh, of selections um, and so forth. So now switching from domestic animals to human beings, um, which is one of the key things that I try to do in nursery is talk about that. First got into the literature and simply asked the question, does flavor nutrient learning occur in humans? And there's evidence for that. There's some really good evidence, especially if you get into some of the anthropological literature, more so probably in there than in some of the scientists just haven't really studied that much in human beings. I don't think that the it's just not much on the radar screen, you know, to study that. But in the anthropological literature, you know, cravings for fruit with scurvy, holy cow, it's... There's just so much really interesting, interesting evidence that fits with what we were seeing when I was watching goats eat wood rat houses, or watching goats self-medicate, or whatever it is. Um, Piling with mineral deficits, craving for salt with salt deprivation, craving for cod liver oil with rickets. I'll come back to that one on Claire Davis. Uh, uh, craving for fat on lean meat diets. This whole idea of rabbit starvation. When people were, you've heard about that, Doug? Huh? When, when explorers were up in, the, in Canada and into Alaska back in the day, the native folks knew this that, like, for every three bites of meat, you need a big bite of fat if you're on those really high meat diets. Um, but the, some of the early explorers didn't know that and they literally starved to death. They, were, they would overeat, overeat, overeat meat trying to get what little fat was in the meat. But it became more and more toxic for them basically because their body had to deal with that huge protein load and couldn't detoxify. So uh, I could go on a lot, I won't, but, but there, there's just a lot of examples. Um, in that literature. Now, if you go back to what I showed you with the straw, 
really, that's what I think, and this is going to sound like the critic again, but I think that's what's happened within the fast food industry, within the ultra-processed and processed diet industry, is that it's really taken something that's um, not all that good for us, and um, link the flavors with, with high energy, refined carbohydrates, to do two things, lure people to novel food by dressing it in known and liked flavors, yeah. and then exact, and then hit them with a blast of energy. Huh? We conditioned incredibly strong preferences in goat, sheep, cows, whatever it was we looked at, with a, with a blast of energy, followed by something even as worthless as straw. Huh? So I see that as really a parallel with what's with what's happened. Um, and then, and this 